Good evening, and welcome back to Paragool Paranormal Discoveries from the Dark, the radio show where we dive into the shadows and the dark to see what lies beneath. I'm your host, Katie Culpa, and today we're diving into the history of a local pub and brewery here in Regina, Saskatchewan. And this particular pub is known for more than just its drinks and good food. It has a haunted past that might make you think twice about closing time. So grab a seat, maybe even a stiff drink, and let's get started. The Regina's Warehouse District was not always full of warehouses. However, it was always involved in the railway that ran through Regina back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So specifically, back in 1882, the railway came from eastern Canada to cut across the prairies, passing right through Regina. With that, the train station for the city was actually originally located north of the tracks for the first 10 years, so not where it, the Regina Casino now is. It had been built near Broad Street, making it within the borders of the now Warehouse District. Otherwise, much of the area, you know, the Warehouse District as we know it today, was actually a residential area. It had lots of open spaces for development by the city, And on the corner of Dudney Avenue and Cornwall Street, where we're going to be focusing here today, was actually a Chinese laundry. Apparently, according to one article in The Morning Leader on August 14th, 1911, 2204 Dudney Street was even noted as a local opium den. I don't know if that has anything to do with the hauntings that are around that area today, but it was still an interesting finding nonetheless. Unfortunately for all that lived in the area back when it was a residential zone, an F4 tornado swept through the middle of Regina on June 30th, 1912. It had been a surprise to have such a large tornado hit Regina that day. And it had passed by the newly constructed legislative building up through Wascana Lake before proceeding north through Regina. During the event, there were 28 fatalities Uh, within, you know, very short amount of time, with hundreds more injured and thousands of people left homeless. Quite a few buildings were destroyed, including the Regina Library, which had just been redone, uh, telephone exchange buildings, churches, two Chinese laundry businesses, so not only the one that we're talking about the location here today, as well as many, many homes, as I've said. So that tornado then continued right up through the area of Dudney and Cornwall. At the time, the laundry in the corner was called the Mac Lung Laundry. It doesn't appear that anyone actually died in the laundry building that day, although they were originally listed as missing in the papers on July 4th, 1912. But the names that were listed later on as fatalities did not include the residents and workers of Mac Lung Laundry. So lucky for them. Now, after overcoming the grief and devastation that the tornado caused to the small population of Regina, the city began to rebuild. That residential area north of the main railway station quickly changed and became a booming warehouse area, which would later be named the Warehouse District, as we know it now. One of the few remaining buildings in the area after the tornado was actually the Ackerman Building, So if you drive down Dudney today, you'd be able to still see the Ackerman building still standing. In fact, if you look closely on the back of the building, the tallest part of the building, you can still see where some areas were damaged that they had to repair. So you can actually still see some of the original damage from the tornado. But slowly the area started to sell these large warehouse lots because they now had, you know, all the houses were cleaned up. So there was no more houses in the area. And on the corner of Dudney Avenue and Cornwall Street, where that little laundry building once stood, a wholesale grocery company named Campbell, Wilson and Strathdee started to build a new warehouse building. Now, back then they said it was going to be the Cadillac of warehouse buildings for the time. They had brought in the Winnipeg architect, Jay Russell, 
and he was hired to design a new building in Chicago style with red and brown brick and a Tyndall stone foundation and detailing. I love reading about uh, architecture in this era, like this time zone, um, because they just love their Tyndall stone. I think it's so funny. Anyway, James Strassey was a junior partner in the grocery warehouse company, hence his name was in the warehouse name, and he was chosen to oversee and manage the building and store. Now, in March 1914, the building was completed with five stories and large arched windows along the first floor. The adjacent railway worked really well for the grocery, allowing pallets to be unloaded from the railway and into the warehouse directly. So if you go down Dudney, you will see this building as it is now. So it hasn't changed much other than it has been separated into different businesses and condos and things like that. Now, Strathdee's office was located on the first floor, which is where the business offices were located within the main doors right when it first opened. The warehouse went on to be very successful in southern Saskatchewan, allowing Strathdee to also rise in Regina society. However, unfortunately, Strathdee would not remain so lucky. In 1933, he was involved in a collision while traveling back to Regina from Alberta, leading to a suspected head injury that he brushed off his minor. Unfortunately for him, though, the injury appeared to be more serious than he let on, and it led him to actually be considered incapable of continuing on in his position at the warehouse. So obviously there was some conflict and, and stress going on there. After the Campbell, Wilson, and Strathy building was no longer a grocery store, it has gone through many changes. And if we fast forward to present day, when you approach the warehouse building on the corner of Dudney Avenue and Cornwall Street, you'll see something very different than you would have in the early 1920s. Instead of this busy, bustling grocery warehouse, you'll find a favorite local gathering spot. And if you're lucky, you'll arrive on one of the many nights that Bushwhackers holds events, including local bands or Irish dancers. There's even a local artist wall showcasing local artist work from Saskatchewan. The Bushwhacker Brew Pub moved into the lower floors of the warehouse back in 1991, and since then they have been serving Regina residents and visitors with award-winning craft beers and pub food. What many visitors of the Brew Pub don't realize is that you aren't necessarily alone when you visit, no matter how empty the Brew Pub looks there may be always someone watching over the building. Now, there have been many stories of the unexplained in the building that it has become known as a local haunt here in Regina, and it's one of my favorite places to visit. We'll go into some of these stories and personal accounts from the building, which I was lucky enough to hear during a tour of the brew pub back in 2022. But first, let's talk a bit about who they think might be haunting the building. So the primary suspect as the ghost of the Bushwhacker Brew Pub, and realistically the whole building itself, I imagine, is that of James Strathdee himself. As I mentioned, Strathdee had been removed from the grocery after his head injury was deemed to make him unfit for his job. So there was definitely, some, you know, those bad feelings or some stress going on between the new manager and Strathdee himself and probably with the old partners as well, if I'm being honest. In the newspapers, it spoke of him also reducing his involvement in local clubs and business organizations as Strathy started to step back more and more from Regina society following his head injury. So already we have, you know, some stress and some probably arguments happening that, you know, we don't get to see in newspaper clippings, of course, but there was probably some stuff going on. And so on the morning of Thursday, October 15th, 1936, there was a surprise for everyone. The Leader Post cover page read in large letters, James Strathdee, Regina, found shot. The article continues as follows. Discovery of body is made near highway. Body of James, 60, prominent Regina wholesaler, was found in a rain-swept ditch on a by-road about six miles north of Regina on Thursday morning. There was a bullet wound in the neck and a shotgun was beside the body. An automobile was parked in a field across the road, 
The body was clothed in a blue business suit and gray gloves, a green hat beside it. Dr. C. E. McCutcheon, coroner, has ordered an inquest be held, and Constable, Constable Percy Mann is conducting investigations for the mounted police. The body was found by three railway section workers who passed near the spot at 10.20 a.m. on a gas speeder. Now, the article continues to discuss who the railway men were and that they ran to the nearest farmhouse to call an ambulance as soon as the body was found. It was also discovered later on that some of the children attending a school nearby actually had reported to their teacher at 8.30 that morning that they had heard a shot while on their way to school. But I guess in the time, it wasn't uncommon for shots to be you know, fired in the middle of a field, so no one paid attention to it. Now, I'll read you the last section of the article, the same article from that same day, as it does go into more detail about who James Strathy was to Regina. So here we go. Mr. Strathy was 60 years of age. He was born in Kincardinshire, hopefully I got that name right, Scotland, and received his education in Scotland. In 1902, he married and came to Canada to spend his honeymoon. When he and his wife reached Winnipeg, he contacted officials of Campbell Brothers and Wilson, wholesale grocery firm, and received an appointment with the firm. In 1912, he came to Regina as manager of the Regina branch of the company, which later became Campbell, Wilson, and Strathdee. Some time later, he founded a branch of the company at Swift Current under the name of Campbell, Wilson, and Hare with R.B. or Bert Hare as manager. Surviving him are his widow, three daughters, Mrs. M.D. Mitchell, Regina, Nora, and Mary at home, and one son, William, attending Manitoba University. During his 24 years residence in Regina, James Strathdee has been known as one of its foremost citizens in civic community welfare. Three years ago, he was chairman of the Assessment Commission. He had been connected with the Board of Trade for many years and was at various times a member of the Council of the Board. He was particularly interested in transportation matters and headed over several Regina committees, cooperating with committees of other Western Boards of Trade in the discussion of freight rates. He took a great interest in the early development of the Port of Churchill and was a strong supporter of the shipping through the Northern Port. He was also a prominent member of the Canadian Club. So as you can see, even just based on this article of, you know, the day he was found shot, he was an important figure here in Regina society for many years before, you know, he was, his body was found in that ditch in 1936. So it was quite a shock to the community for this to happen. Now, on October 16th, only one day after that article of surprise, however, the newspapers reported that investigations were closed on the matter. So here's what the very short two paragraphs said about James Strathdee the day after he was found. Strathdee funeral rites for Saturday. An inquest will not be necessary into the death of James Strathdee Prominent Regina businessman found shot in a ditch on the northern outskirts of Regina on Thursday. Dr. C. E. McCutcheon, coroner, announced on Friday. Funeral services will be held in Westminster United Church at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Reverend A. D. McKenzie will officiate and burial will be at Regina Cemetery. And that was it. (laughs) There was nothing ever reported on what exactly happened to Strathy that day. Some suspect a suicide, others suspect a murder that got covered up because, you know, as you know, there was a lot of tension between Strathdee and the new manager of the warehouse, or maybe it was between Strathdee and, you know, the old partners, who knows. Either way, it does kind of make you wonder if his spirit is still roaming because of whether there was an injustice that occurred to him while he was alive and he shouldn't have been taken off or whether it ended up with him ending his life, or with someone even taking it from him. We might never know the real story. So let's get back to the present, because now I want to let you know a little bit of the ghost stories and personal accounts that have been shared with me. 
Uh, because over the years, staff and patrons have reported numerous eerie experiences. And thankfully, the current bar manager, Grant, has been collecting them and, you know, sharing them with those that are interested or that want to go on tours of the Bushwhacker Brew Pub. And he was really happy to share them with my husband and I while we toured the basement and parts of the pub itself uh, back in 2022. So Grant has been working at the location almost the entirety that it's been open. So this is probably why his stories extend much longer than just the last few years. And many of the stories, although sometimes sending a shiver down your spine, to me, it just indicates that there's, you know, somebody watching over the building, making sure that the workers aren't slacking off and that nobody is wrecking the place. My favorite story is one that Grant told us that actually had to do with a different part of the building. So it wasn't directly in the Bushwhacker Brew Pub itself. At the time, a man named Dave owned an antique store on the third floor. So as I said, they have separated the uh, building up quite a bit to let different businesses have different pieces of it, as well as I think there's condos on the top floors. And so one night, Dave on the third floor had come down pale and shaky into Bushwhacker Brew Pub. And at the time, Grant was working at the bar at the time. And so he asked, Dave asked Grant to please pour him a drink. Then he went on to let Grant know that he had an unusual experience as he was closing his antique shop. So apparently while locking up, he had to close and lock this big wrought iron gate. And as he was doing that, he realized that there was a light still turned on in the back of his shop. Although he didn't really believe in the ghost stories or believe that James was really haunting the place, he decided to call out, Hey Jim! Can you turn that light out for me? And apparently it was a light that had, you know, the three brightness settings. So as Dave stood there, about to leave the light on and go downstairs, he saw the light go brighter, brighter, and then after a few seconds, it switched off. The only time that the resident ghosts, or maybe it's ghosts, uh, interacted with the staff otherwise, uh, well, and physically, I mean, was actually in the grain room. So the grain room is actually in the basement. And while taking a break from grinding the malted barley for the brewery, one of the assistant brewers at the time was actually pushed from behind. So there was only himself and the main brewer in the room. And it's a small room. I've been in it myself. And you have to close the door when you're actually, you know, grinding the malted barley because you don't want all of that dust leaving the room and going around the basement. So they were in there by themselves. The door was closed. The assistant brewer was, um, you know, standing and watching maybe. Maybe he wasn't, you know, helping out. And that's why the ghost decided to give him a shove. I don't know. But at any rate, he did get a rather big shove in the back. So the assistant brewer quickly left the room to go into the bathroom. And when he lifted his shirt to look at his back, a red handprint was there between his shoulder blades where he had felt the invisible hand push him. Another story comes again in the Bushwhacker basement. So the Bushwhacker club room, which is downstairs, it is a room that can be rented for social gatherings and has also been had its own fair share of experiences. In one, one of the kitchen staff was cleaning up a spill, but he left the mop in the middle of the room to go upstairs for a few minutes. Then when he came back down to, you know, continue mopping the floors, he found that there was a wide, wet circle had been left on the floor as if the mop had, you know, been dragged or moved around in this large circle. But the mop and bucket had been, or, and and the mop and bucket, I should say, had moved from where he had left it. There was no one else in the area, so it is unknown how the mop had been dragged around the room. Another story in that same room is they actually did have a paranormal investigator come in and they let them come and try to actually speak with James to see if they can get some information. And apparently nothing happened during the actual actual investigation. But when they were sitting down and getting set up, you know, apparently something, I think it was like a ping pong ball or something was sitting on a table and it flew across the room. 
but that was all that happened. So I think the ghost doesn't like to be, you know, put on camera or listened to by, you know, those um, EVP devices and things. But that was another one that happened in that same club room. And if we move to the boiler room, which is located at the end of the, an old hallway behind a small red door, and really this old red door could be part of a horror movie in itself because it even does like the old creaking thing. It's at the end of this like door or long hallway that's under you know, some construction because they never finished it because it's not public facing, so they didn't need to. Um, but so the original bo boiler is located in that room and they let me go and check it out, of course. Of course, the old boiler has been long decommissioned because it was coal fired. But because it was coal fired, that also means there was an area for the coal pile in the room, which obviously had a small hole in the wall that led up to the alley so that whenever they needed more coal, it could just be shoveled down the chute to land in that pile directly from the alley. You didn't have to go through the entire building to get there. And what happened in this specific space was the brewer was at the time bent down looking at the new boiler because they put in a new one right in the same room. And all of a sudden, small pieces of coal started being thrown from somewhere in the coal pile. Now, the interesting thing about that is the coal pile is behind an actual like concrete wall. So it would be really hard to, you know, climb up there and hide, I would think. Uh, but yeah, suddenly small pieces of coal were being thrown. And the interesting part about this one is it happened early in the morning. So I found that interesting because a lot of times we talk about how these ghost things happen in the middle of the night, you know, when it's dark. But a lot of the stories I tend to hear happen during the day. So the ghosts don't only come out at night. <laughs> Now, of course, there's other stories ranging from your typical hearing voices calling out to you, but no one is there, or, you know, rolls of plastic wrap flying off the counter while the prep cooks were cutting up vegetables. Overall, the ghosts seem to be rather shy, or maybe James is just a quiet man and he doesn't want to cause too much trouble, as they don't like to come out when new people are visiting. And... The bushwhacker ghosts seem to prefer to come out in the early, more early morning hours, like I said, to have some fun making staff aware that they're there, still watching over the place. And a final ghost story I'll tell you before we continue on, although we don't know if it was James or not, also incur occurred in the morning again, right around opening time. So at this point, there was a, someone working the front and, you know, they were opening up the place and getting it you know, first thing in the morning when they first open and they reported seeing a man walk in the front doors, come up the stairs, but then instead of coming actually into the main area of, you know, the pub, they turned left and walked into a small private room that's directly off the main entrance. This is another one of the rooms that you can actually rent for small, you know, gatherings or small people or small groups of people. So, but you weren't supposed to go sit in there if you're just coming to the pub to eat, unless, you know, they're having an event and they have it open. So this person that was working that morning, she actually followed the man to ask him, you know, to let him know, hey, that room is not available right now. Would you like to come sit in the main area? But as soon as she entered the room, there was nobody there. The man had disappeared. He wasn't there. There's bathrooms in there. There's, well, he wasn't in the bathroom. He was just gone. So that kind of makes me wonder, uh, you know, going back to what we talked about with the warehouse when it was first opened, that area had offices. So obviously someone was coming to their office that morning at 11 o'clock or whatever time it was, and they didn't even notice the staff opening up the pub, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but the warehouse district does have a large past, as we've talked about. It's hard to say what may have occurred there before Regina was even a city. Since Regina became a city here in Saskatchewan, though, the area lived through being a residential zone, even with its own opium den, apparently, which is a story for another time, I'm sure. It even survived a F4 tornado. Well, I guess the buildings didn't survive, but there was an F4 tornado that went through. And then... 
Many have been involved in a potential cover-up for a murder over a Cadillac grocery store of the 1920s. Or maybe it was just a very unfortunate suicide. Who knows? Now, today it is a much happier location. It is bustling with music, beer, and good food. Who knows what will come for the location in the future to add to this haunted past. Have you ever visited a haunted location or had a paranormal experience? Share your stories with me on social media or through my website. As I've said in previous uh, episodes, you can always find me on most of the social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. You can connect with me there. As I said, it is letter K, D, K, U, L, P, A, and you can find me as well as some videos and things like that. You can also let me know what your favorite episode is or what you would like featured in the future. Thank you for tuning in and joining me on this audio tour of one of our local haunts here in Regina. In the next episode, we will be chatting with another guest. Melanie Cole is going to be coming on to the show to talk about a chilling true crime story that she dug up from Saskatchewan's history. And I imagine there's going to be a lot that we'll be talking about, so it may even go across two shows instead of just the one, because we'll be learning about one of the potential suspects behind the hauntings of the Corrobert Courthouse and why his spirit has been unable to rest. If you want to support the podcast, we can go on more adventures, searching for paranormal experiences around Western Canada, then make sure you go check out our Patreon as a patron, you get also get access to extra content that didn't make the episodes, behind-the-scenes information, and a live Q&A session with me once a month. So stay tuned for our upcoming episodes, where we'll uncover more secrets, unravel more mysteries, and delve deeper into the shadows. Until then, remember to keep your flashlights handy and digital recorders ready. This is Katie Kalpa, signing off. Until next time, my ghouls. <laughs>